Creativity in human history and innovation is a playful endeavor. It's something that we are naturally inclined to do, and it depends upon certain elements of human psychology. And so this underpins a lot of my approach to providing a narrative of history. So as someone who is an intellectual historian, and I have a book, Paradox at Play, where I've written on Meister Eckhart and given a kind of recapitulation of intellectual history, specific to the history of the individual. So history of identity, the notion of self from ancient Greece and polytheistic times all the way through uh, the time of, of Meister Eckhart and insisting that this kind of undercurrent of metaphysical change was responsible for what it is that we see in his rhetoric. But more than this, when we see new ideas and insights the surrounding culture naturally flows immediately like water that has been spilled or let go or a dam that has broken, and it flows into all of the recesses and areas that it possibly can. That's the kind of thing that we see with innovation in time with history, which is why we have golden ages of physics, for instance, that follow major discoveries, which is exactly what we saw, for instance, with Einstein's work and with the work in quantum physics in the 1920s. And so when you have major changes and major breaks, then history flows, creativity flows, and fills all of those natural, normal science gaps. And that's ultimately the first stop that I want to make in terms of a commentary here, is that I'm modifying, conscientiously modifying, Thomas Kuhn's notion of paradigms. And so I'm suggesting a modification to this insofar as he describes a situation where you have paradigmatic changes that are completely incommensurate with one another, so that you have, you know, an old paradigm in physics, a new paradigm in physics, and then you have this kind of mounting force as we get towards a revolution where we can no longer explain away everything and then eventually the tide crushes it and it flows into a new revolutionary era. And then you have a period of normal science and engineering which explores all the details. Here's how I want to modify that story. I want to suggest that this is underwritten not only by a period of normal science where we're rationally exploring all of the different possibilities in terms of technology and theory and different things that we can do with a new piece of mathematics or physics or whatever it might happen to be, but also in psychology. There's something important here, and it has to do with the nature of insight and how it is that insight affects the mind. Insight is a kind of firestorm of associations, and we can see this in brain scans and people who actually come to understand something. So you have this kind of aha moment or the famous eureka moment in ancient Greece, right, where you suddenly, you know, cast off everything and run naked through the streets of Athens. So we're told. And... But we're familiar with the aha moments where you work and you work and you work to try and understand how to do something in mathematics, especially, or computer programming or music or art or anything. And then finally it occurs to you. What happens in that moment when it occurs to you? That moment is a moment of insight. And the insight in the mind is a kind of firestorm of associations. And what I mean by that is less metaphorical than practical and physical in the sense that we are able to suddenly find a lot of new connections. We're able to suddenly make a lot of new associations. And that allows us to connect areas and ideas that were previously unconnected. And when I say connected, we might even think literally connected in a, you know, neural sense. I don't want to go there all the way, but at the same time, it's not completely unfair. And so because of that, what you're doing is you're opening up pathways and making it possible to naturally think through all of these other things that you see. And so I previously didn't associate tennis with racquetball in the swing or, you know, baseball with being able to operate a forklift or I don't know, whatever it is. Once you've made that connection and insight has shown you, hey, this seems viable to me, it seems like it fits. It has a certain harmony to it. And I'm using those as technical terms from the phenomenological tradition. And so going back to Husserl in the, you know, uh, in 19th, early 20th centuries. So there's that. But I also used another phrase, and that is thinking things through. So Hans Blumenberg in his philosophical anthropology pointed to this kind of thing. And so Blumenberg was a 20th century philosopher who did a lot of work with history and intellectual history and trying to explain changes over time, big changes in terms of, you know, metaphysical undercurrents and the transition from the medieval to the modern world and the emergence of the Renaissance and et cetera, et cetera. So 
one of the ways that he does this, there's a trope in his work that it's not obvious unless you read a lot of him. But if you read a lot of him, it stands out. And it's like, what is he doing there? Where he says they are thinking things through to the end. As if to say the logic was already set, the reasoning was already set, the space was already open, and they simply had to think things through to the end. Oftentimes with the implication in his writing that they would find a contradiction or a problem. And then in thinking things through to the end, it would eventually sow the seeds of the next question that needed to be asked via its problem pressure and overturning things, which is his version of revolution and modifying, by the way, Kuhn's paradigms. Blumenberg does away with Kuhn in a footnote. It's about a page and a half worth of work. It's, it's absolutely brilliant, but nevertheless. So that's kind of interesting. Again, published after the structure of scientific Nevel uh, revolutions in 1962, which is Thomas Kuhn's seminal work in philosophy of science. So that's curious. <laughs> So I want to modify Blumenberg there as well by pointing to this phenomenon of insight. And the key behind insight is that it functions in a way that a new technology does, such that we're not just opening things up and then slowly filling out all of the gaps. There's a kind of, I mean, dare we say, punctuated equilibrium in terms of jumps with evolutionary time and being able to suddenly flood in and do a lot of other things. Well, that's exactly what we see with technology, right? I mean, as soon as a new thing is available that suddenly brings things together and makes something really cool possible, like let's say the touchscreen and the iPhone, then all of a sudden, the floodgates open and you have a lot of innovation very quickly. The same kind of thing is witnessed, I think, with these, you know, app stores that we're seeing with the, uh, with the iPhone and Android and now also with AI. And so that's curious. And what this tells us is that the punctuated equilibrium phenomenon of insight, of technological change, and of sudden change is a modification that's needed to Kuhn's paradigm theory in saying that there's another kind of thing. Let's provide some additional color and some additional detail here. There is another kind of thing that can happen inside of normal science with respect to a change. And so these changes don't have to necessarily be revolutionary changes, but it's also not necessarily slow. It can be a very sudden burst of creative energy. So let's now wrap this all the way back to the beginning. My view on history generally and the way that I like to construct historical narratives is as though we have a metaphysical undercurrent. In other words, there is a foundation of worldview in the way that we see the world, the way that we understand what the world is, what we are, what we are in relation to the world, what the divine is, what we are in relation to the divine in relation to the world, and so on. These kinds of things undergird all of our thought, all of our perception, and all of our feeling. And so these are the basis for us being able to understand anything in the world. Those are the things that tend to change slowly over time. And we're not really aware of those. It's hard for us to think about them because the thinking has to happen posterior to that kind of worldview foundation. This is tough, but it's it's not completely unthinkable, right? So it's it's a challenging concept, but it's not impossible. So you have a foundation that largely goes unthought because thought happens posterior to that foundation. And so the thought that happens then is what we have in terms of written works and dialogues and in reports and historical narratives and all of philosophy and all this kind of stuff. And so that kind of thing only gives us an indication of what's going on underneath and oftentimes happens later than what's happening underneath. Bloomberg pointed to this by studying metaphor, and I am pointing to this not just through metaphor, but by broadening the scope there and saying, look, we're really dealing with large scale uh, foundational elements of what constitutes a worldview. And as those change, then we see it's like tectonic plates moving underneath the earth. We have no idea what's going on, you know, and then just suddenly the continents have moved and you find yourself in a different place. And suddenly South America is a long way from Africa and, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so then things change in accordance with that. 
And it follows a kind of biological evolutionary paradigm in the sense of some of the change happens slowly and in contact with other things. Some of the change happens much more suddenly. But I want to point to this not just in biological terms, but like I said, in psychological terms and add the additional dimension of insight, because I think that's crucial. I think it's something that it's hard for us to think about. I haven't found a tremendous amount of work. I mean, this is kind of my area, and I haven't found a lot of work and a lot of other people talking about what the nature of insight is and how exactly things happen. You know, what happens in that transformational moment when all of a sudden you understand calculus or something much simpler. <laughs> You know, and the same kind of thing, of course. And I try, I said that I studied the, you know, most profound potentially version of this, the most profound change in the sense of the deepest change in religious conversion. And so what happens when someone undergoes that kind of cataclysmic change along the lines of what Augustine did in the confessions? Well, we quickly resort to metaphor and a, you just kind of have to be there sort of approach, but it's not completely impossible for us to try and understand something about the nature of that change, or at least have a better appreciation for why it is that we can't say it in words, because the words are posterior to the foundational level of where the change is actually occurring. So that is why I advocate for a kind of history flows like water uh, approach to understanding and constructing historical narratives and understanding, especially intellectual history, so that the water is suddenly, you know, bursting through a dam and flows into the surrounding areas and does all of those things and it may get caught up and then all of a sudden there's insight and it flows into a new area. And I think these are exactly the, the kind of things that we see. And I believe, by the way, as a hint, a final provocative hint, that it may not be a coincidence that the interior life of the individual in terms of other us learning things and experiencing worldview changes is a microcosm of the macro level view of large scale intellectual historical changes that still happen according to that same psychological profile with insight. Just a suggestion.